All right, so the title of my message today is that everything is possible. Come on, somebody, say everything is possible. Say all things are possible. Now, we're going to jump right into this verse, Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, and it says this, but with God, everything is possible. Now, when we talk like that, when we use scriptures like that, many people get excited because they like this language. They, they, they think what we're going to talk about is how God can handle my miracle. <laughs> they get excited because they think, oh, that means I can do anything. That means God is capable for anything in me. Now, I'm going to talk about your miracle today, but I'm probably not, not going to talk about it the way you might expect me to talk about it. I want to, to talk about my trip to Vietnam, and I want to say thank you again to all of you who supported that trip financially. I very much appreciate it. In fact, I am going to put together a little report, and I have a gift for each and every one of you who supported the trip financially. Now, if you didn't support the trip financially, you're not going to get that gift. Okay, so I'm not trying to shame anybody. I just want to let you know that if you did, I've got something for you. Now, it'll be a week or two before I have that ready, so be patient because we're busy with Resurrection Sunday and conference here. Give me a, a little bit more time to get that put together. But I just want to say thank you to all of you who helped support that trip. Now, I think it's beneficial for everybody every American at some point in their life or at several points in their life to get out of their comfort zone and see what the world is like outside of westernized culture. That is something that uh, many people don't experience as Americans and I'm telling you that if you've never experienced that, you might be shocked to find out what a lot of the world lives like. It will blow your mind how the rest of the world or the majority of the world is living. I think it's good for us to get out and to, uh, this table fell apart a moment ago, to get out and see the world. How many of you agree with me? Okay, so if you've never been to another country, you've never been anywhere, I would encourage you to be praying where might God send you? I know right now we are talking to Jonathan and Sarah about taking a team to Africa. So I don't know the details yet. Come on, somebody. Come on. We want to help them. We want to help them financially. We want to help them with our prayers. We want to help them in reality. And so most likely it'll be in about a year, year and a few months, uh, summer of 2020. So if that's something you believe that you'd like to do, come talk to me. Let's, let's put together a list of people that would, would like to go. I'm going to tell you right now, if you've never been outside of the United States of America, this might not be the trip for you, okay? There may be safer and, and easier places for you to get to because this is not, you know, missionary trip 101. This is a little bit more advanced. If you think God's talking to you, and you believe that God's telling you to go, well then, that's one thing. But uh, I want to encourage you to get out of your comfort zone and see how other people are living. So I want to talk to you about our trip to Vietnam. So I've got some pictures for you. Hopefully our technology will work today. It hasn't yet. Let's see if it does. Sometimes it's a little slow. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to show you some pictures. and. Uh, I'm telling you, Vietnam is a beautiful, beautiful place. Now, <laughs> traffic is not quite like Blue Lakes, uh, the, the, the road in our town. I've seen the bumper sticker that some people have, pray for me, I drive Blue Lakes. If you have that bumper sticker, you have no idea what real traffic is. We do not have traffic in Twin Falls County. <laughs> or in the state of Idaho that even resembles places in America, much less places in Saigon like this. Now, just to give you a frame of reference, this is a two-lane road. Two lanes going each way. So that's basically Addison. Walk, when you leave church today, get on on Addison, you see, now imagine squeezing about, you know, 60 or 70 scooters all next to each other in that space. 
So you can see that the traffic and congestion is just at a whole nother level. Now, I want you to see this picture because at a glance, you see this prosperity. You see these big buildings. Look, there's one, two, three, four cranes. You know what that means? It means they're building big buildings. But what's really easy for you to do is to look right over what's in the bottom of the picture. If you look down here, you see this is pretty... Um, normal to see in Vietnam. These incredible buildings and prosperity and, and looks like technology and, and wealth. And in the same frame, you see absolute poverty, like nothing you would see in the United States of America. I, I don't know anywhere where you see this, this is not a landfill. This is not scrap metal. People live in these structures right here, and that's right off the path here. And you can see across the river here, it's just riddled with tiny little uh, makeshift shacks that people are living in. In uh, one of the coastal cities that we went to, we, we saw that this is this a little bay, and you can see that it's absolutely covered with people in all different kinds of boats. And a lot of them are these... I, for a lack of a better explanation, they're like a, the size of a kiddie pool, like an inflatable kid's pool, a lot firmer than that, obviously. And they're all over, and these people are fishing, and they will stay out there all day, and I mean all day, fishing, and then somebody will come around to them, and they will take what they've caught in. So you see these people staying in these little boats, and they will be fishing, and that's what their, their life is like. Now, if you look at this picture, you can see, I love this picture, because not only do you see, <laughs> just so you know, there is a helmet law in, in Vietnam. You, it's, you, according to the law, you have to wear a helmet, but strapping a child onto the back, that's totally okay. And then, I don't know, I tried to count the, the water bottles in this picture, and I think I counted about 10 of those heavy five-gallon water bottles all strapped to a scooter. These scooters are absolutely everywhere. I mean, absolutely everywhere. In fact, I, I was really hoping that I could ride one of the scooters. I did not get that opportunity. But in my mind, it would be something like the running with the bulls that they do in Spain. I mean, you, you just have to imagine. They, they're, they just go. That's, that's how traffic is here. They just go. There's, I mean, they have signals. They have stoplights that are loosely observed. But for the most part, people just go. And when the, if the, the, the road's full, you know what they do? They hop on the sidewalk and bzz, they go down the sidewalk. And, and that is just how it goes. I would love for the opportunity to, to ride one of those scooters and ride across town. But uh, nobody let me do that yet. You can see here, this is a Vietnamese minivan. <laughs> that is one, two, three, four people, a family of four riding on that bike. And many times we saw five on, I don't know if I ever actually saw more than five people on one of those scooters. And a lot of times they'll put little bitty kids in the space here where you can stand. <laughs> and... Uh, just absolutely amazing to see how the, the people get along there. Now, this picture really interested me because I see these, this nice couple. Uh, I assume they're coming back from what was be the equivalent of the grocery store because they seem to have a lot of supplies. And I wonder if you can tell what, what I can tell. Can you tell what they're going to have for dinner? Um, because if you look a little closer, <laughs> that is a live duck in a bag hanging off the size, side of that scooter. And you know that duck is probably just so happy. These people picked me. Uh, they said I get to come home for dinner. Uh, this duck is really excited. But I'm betting, I don't know this, but I'm betting that is not a pet. I think they're going to have... Uh, some duck soup later on this evening or that evening. Just an incredible culture. Let me t show you some of the people that we met there. Now, this was the first orphanage that we went to. And man, doesn't this kid have just a million dollar smile? Come on, somebody. And this room is just full of these sweet children and they're eating, uh, it's, a, it's a common Vietnamese dish called pho. 
Uh, you'll probably see it in America, we call it pho, because it's spelled P-H-O, but that's not how they say it. And uh, if you eat it in America, it's probably pretty good, because they've Americanized it. But if you eat it in Vietnam, yeah, not so much. Uh, maybe you'd like it. Some people love it. I typically lose weight when I travel because I just can't eat anything. Uh, and what's crazy about it is all the little chicken chunks like that, that is chicken, but it'll be full of bones because the only way they cut up a chicken is with a cleaver. You whack, 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 and throw it in the soup. And, uh, but these kids are just awesome. I want to show you one of, the, one of my favorite couples that we met. This is Esther and her husband, uh, Tuan. And they are pastors in the city of Saigon. And these are two of the most amazing people that I've ever met in my life. Now, first of all, I'm, I'm hoping that someday we get to have uh, one or both of them come here to our church to talk to you. And it's not that far-fetched because I think they're going to be in... Uh, Houston, maybe later this year. So maybe it'll work out. I know Wayne and I were talking about maybe getting them to come up here. But if you could hear their story of what they've been through personally, the kind of adversity and rejection that they've had to overcome just to be a Christian in their culture. It's not like it is here. They don't have the freedom of religion that you and I take for granted. They've had to overcome extreme rejection, extreme circumstances just to be standing there as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But not only are they standing there, they pastor a church that has five locations around Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon, same place. Okay? It's incredible. And when you see what people will do to get to church, it, it really makes us rethink our priorities and how we do things around here. So in this picture, this is Esther. Now, one of the things that, that, that they were talking about that just blew me away is they said they wanted to have some curriculum for the kids. Now, here in America... We get online, we do a Google search for kids' curriculum for churches, and there's like 17 gazillion options. What the hard part that we have is choosing. Honestly, that's, that's what we have to deal with, is trying to narrow it down what's any good, what's good quality, what's affordable, because a lot of it's very expensive. She was like, there's a lot of great curriculum out there, but none of it is in Vietnamese. So they had to invent and create curriculum for their children's ministry that was in Vietnamese. And what she's demonstrating here is they have made this pop-up book, and this one's a bit of a mock-up, but they have made this pop-up book so that when, when kids open it, all the little characters pop out. Now listen, pop-up books are cool, but they made this themselves in their office, her and her team. They're just amazing people. And I'm telling you, you could look at any of the stuff that they've had made and you wouldn't go, oh, that's cute. It looks homemade. Uh-uh. It is professional. It looks first class. They offered to give me one that I could bring back, but A, I didn't want to take one away from them and B, it's in Vietnamese, so it wouldn't do a whole lot of good. Others say, wow, isn't this nice? So I left it with them. But as you can, if you can see closely in this picture, she's explaining to, well, she would be explaining to kids that the cross is laid down here and it pops out, is the bridge between heaven and mankind, showing that Jesus is the way. And it's just incredible. Now, what I want you to understand about them and about the way life is in their world. So they, most of the buildings there in Vietnam are tall and skinny, very thin. And uh, if you could see... If I turn the camera around and you could see out of the front of their building, it's a completely different view. So in this picture, does not even begin to do justice. How many of you have ever been to a real landfill? I mean a real one. Not the transfer station where you throw things into a big truck. I'm talking about the real landfill where you drive out on the garbage. Okay, that's what this looks like. That's what this, and this is supposed to be a stream right here among the buildings. You can see there's old debris and rubble, and this stream is just riddled with garbage. 
This is literally just right outside the door where this family is making this curriculum. And you can see, to make it even better, it's in the flight path, so they've got all the, the, the planes flying right over them. I just want to help you see it's not like what you and I think life is like. See, this is the orphanage that, that Esther and Tuan oversee, and this orphanage has about, I think it's, Wayne, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's about 85 kids there now, but they you know, fluctuate up over 100 at times, but that, so this picture obviously does not have all of the kids in it. But I want you to see that this is the furniture that the kids are laying on and sleeping on. I didn't show all the pictures, but I have several pictures where they're just laying on what looks like a marble tile floor, flat marble floor. That's where they're laying, that's where they're sleeping. That's where they're hanging out. I mean, your kids have how many video game systems and devices, this true story, true story. My kids, my son up there is complaining to me because his iPhone is not up to date enough. Come on. Now don't judge him. Some of you are thinking the same thing. Like, man, my phone's two generations old. I need a new one. Okay, these kids don't know what a video game system is. They don't have a TV. Their form of entertainment is each other. But let me help you understand something. You try to tell these kids that they're poor or unhappy. Because they don't know it. They don't know it. Most of you know Greg Bostock, and he was there on the trip with us. And our nickname for Greg, especially... Okay. Our nickname for Greg, especially in Vietnam, is Gigantor. Because Greg's a big guy. I mean, I don't know, 6'4", I think, ish, and just big to boot, monster hands. And you can see here, that's his hand compared to little Vietnamese boys. And uh, it's just hilarious to watch Greg walk around because he just towers over everybody there. And it's funny because like the, the bus that we had to, to get around in, he can't fit in, he has to sit sideways because his, his legs literally will not fit straight ahead. And we were somewhere <laughs> and he sat down in a chair and we got up, the chair came up with him because uh, he's just, and, and he's not, a, he's not a, a, a fat guy, he's just a big guy. And uh, Vietnam is a nation of smaller people. And you know, his wife Glenda, and there she is, uh, just loving on this beautiful, precious child. Come on, clap if you're going to clap. Don't if you don't. You don't have to clap for this next picture. This is me with these little boys, and this is not all the little boys. <laughs> this is just some of the little boys in that room, and you can see these kids are just absolutely precious. And I'm telling you, the kindest, sweetest, I'm gonna try not to cry, but it probably won't work. <laughs> we did a, a thing here just a, was right before after this picture was taken where they gave us boxes and boxes of stuff to give away to the kids. And I mean like fruit roll-ups and little snacks and I don't know. It was junk I wasn't paying any attention to, but it, what struck me is that, let's say you had three or four kids over here and you tossed one, you know, because you couldn't reach, and it fell between two kids. Nobody, nobody jumped for it. I never, ever, ever saw a kid try to take something from somebody else. They just waited their turn, and every kid knew that if they didn't get one, well, they'll get, they were grateful for what they had. They weren't trying to take anything from anybody else. And it was just powerful. Here in this picture, you see this is Wayne. Wayne is praying for, for these little kids. And man, I'm telling you, if you've ever seen somebody pray, Wayne calls down fire from heaven when he's praying. And he's just loving on these kids. And it's just an incredible experience. Now, this was only one of like four orphanages that we went to that we got to spend time in or, or places that we got to, to be. And you just sense the passion and the presence of God and what God is doing. 
I just threw this picture in as an extra. This is uh, one of our friends there. His name's Bob Dunham, and he may be the single most amazing human being I've ever met. Uh, he is, I believe, 87 years old. Is that right? Yeah, Wayne's not. 87 years old. I don't know how many times he's been to Vietnam, uh, 20 plus times he's been with the organization Mission Vietnam for all these years. And uh, he was a vet, so he served over there, and just full of life and full of joy. And just to show you how much life and joy he has, those are not his real teeth. He's just screwing around and being funny. An incredible, incredible human being. The world around us is not quite like the world you and I see outside of our door all the time. One of my biggest takeaways from the the trip was just how much some people are willing to sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. And oftentimes in places like America, it's so amazing how hard it is just to get people to attend church, just to get people to participate, just to get people to hear the gospel. When in other people, they will risk everything. They will walk great distances. They will... I mean, you just cannot, I cannot in just a few minutes accurately portray to you the level of sacrifice that many, many, many people in places like Vietnam are willing to do. And I was trying to understand why this is. Why do we, you and I, and I admit, I struggle with it too. Why do you and I struggle and I believe God spoke to me and, and helped me see that in a lot of ways, we're all the rich young ruler. How many of you know the story of the rich young ruler in the Bible? See, I think that many of us are the rich young ruler. And I've said this before, that there are no real poor people in America. And I get that that might sound insensitive. I understand that. And if maybe you're in the room today and you feel like you're poor. You feel like you don't have any money and you're broke. And you might think, well, must be nice for you to say that, Pastor, but if you could walk a mile in my shoes, you'd know what poverty in America was like. I want you to understand I get that. And I understand. And that nothing that I say today is meant to imply that there is no real need in America or that there's nobody that suffers want in America. That's not my point at all, and I, and I absolutely am not trying to shame anybody or criticize anybody. I'm just trying to help you see that the American definition of poor is not the same as the global definition of poor. So I decided to do a little bit of research to, to see if I was just making this up or if, if there was some substance to my opinion here. So I came across a website called federalsafetynet.com and I found this quote here and it says this, overall the total population of the U.S. was, page, was 322.5 million in 2017 and 39.7 million Americans were in poverty. Therefore, the overall poverty rate for the year 2017 was 12.3%. So here I'm up here saying that there's no poor people in America, yet the data suggests that 39.7 million Americans are poor in 2017. Now, the question is, how do we define poverty? Now, this website, and is, as always, if you go to flfc.church, you can see the sermon notes and the links to the data is available to you to look at for yourself. But they define the poverty threshold as basically being below a certain income level. Just below a certain income level. So, and, and here's the thing. If you receive aid... Like, for example, if you have an EBT card, which is the Idaho equivalent of food stamps. Now, again, I'm not shaming anybody. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm glad that our state has that provision if you need it, okay? I just want you to understand that, let's say you have $1,000 available through EBT for your groceries. That $1,000 does not go into the calculation of your income. 
It's a very important detail because if depending on what side of the aisle you are politically, depending on which politician is running for your vote, they're going to make it sound like there's a great massive amount of poverty in America and you need to vote for them to help balance the scales because of all this, you know, ubiquitous poverty in our country. But the reality is, is that when we look at consumption level versus income level, we find that it paints a completely different picture. So I found an article on Forbes.com and the title of the article is this. This is the title. By global standards, there are no American poor. <laughs> and this is a quote that I got off the website. It says this. Even those reporting no income at all in the U.S. have consumption possibilities roughly equal to those reporting incomes of $20 a day. Now, let me help you understand that statement. What they're saying is that in America, even people who make zero dollars at all, reporting zero income, they have as much buying power as poor people in other countries making as much as $20 a day. Now, $20 a day probably doesn't sound like a lot, and it's not a lot. I did the math, it's like, I think, a little over $7,000 a year. So yeah, that's not very much money to live on. But $7,000 a year to live on when you didn't earn any of those dollars a year is a lot to live on when you look at it that way. And let's face it, I mean, listen, I, I'm trying to be clear. I'm not trying to be rude or inconsiderate or insensitive to anybody. But over the years, we've given away at this church millions of dollars worth of food. And uh, we haven't done any of that in quite a while because we haven't had the opportunity to do that. But a few years back, we gave away truckloads of food, truckloads of yogurt and other things. And one of the things that I noticed was that many of the people who came to receive that food were extremely overweight. Now, again, I'm not trying to shame anybody. I, I could stand to lose some weight. If you're a little bit overweight, I'm not trying to say there's anything wrong with you. That's not my point. My point is, if you are overweight, you're not poor. Because in other countries, like in places like Vietnam, poor people aren't overweight because the poor people can't afford food. They can't afford it. They can't buy it. It's not available to them. Poor people in other places in the world are not like poor people in this country. Okay? So I just want to help us understand that on the global scale, statistically, we are above the level of true poverty. Okay, so now in the Gospels, there's this very interesting story. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16, it says this. Someone came to Jesus with this question, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Why ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Now, I want you to understand that already we have a huge setup here. What's the question? It's eternal life. Now, how many of you would like to know the answer to the question? How do you have eternal life? I mean, this is one of the most heavily debated issues in all of Christianity today. What are the exact requirements to go to heaven, to receive eternal life? You see, people's opinions are all over the map. Well, you need to say a prayer. If you said the prayer, you're good. Well, you just need to believe. If you believe, you're good. It's interesting to me that Jesus didn't answer the question that way. He actually said, well, if you want to receive eternal life, you're going to have to do something. Keep the commandments. Okay, so let's keep going. Verse 18. Look at, this is <laughs> the response. Well, which ones? Could you be more specific? I don't you know, that's a lot of commandments. Ah, could, you, could, you nail, could you narrow that down for me? And Jesus does. He says, well, you must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not lie and test, 
testify falsely, honor your mother and father, love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, I've done all of these commandments, the young man replied. What else must I do? Verse 21, Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all of your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad for he had many possessions. I want you to think about that. He went away sad. Get your head around that for just a moment. So, he came to Jesus asking this question. How can I receive eternal life? Jesus gives him an answer. So now the young man is forced into a place where he has to make a decision. Do I want possessions or do I want eternal life? That is the quandary. That is the predicament that Jesus gave to this young man. Now, his response is absolutely astounding because what it suggests is that he said, okay, door number one, I got all my stuff. Door number two, eternal life. He went away sad because he chose door number one. He just couldn't imagine letting go of his stuff because he had many possessions. I always hate it when people act like that people who have more have more to lose than people who have little. Look at verse 23. Then Jesus said said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again. I love that. I'm going to double down. I'll even repeat it. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I've heard this story taught. Yeah, 17,000 exactly. 17,000 times. We've all heard it talked about in church. And the reality is that most of us as Americans, we think of that one rich person we know or those rich people. We think of somebody richer than us. That's how we define it because we think we're not that person. Like, yeah. So I don't know how many rich people you know. I know lots of rich people. I mean, I know some mega multimillionaires. Several of them. And it would be easy for me to read this story and think of them. Think, oh wow, it's going to be hard for them. But very few of us think of ourselves. But I promise you, the reason I set up this message today with all of those statistics is because I want you to understand no matter how poor you are, compared to somebody else, You're filthy, stinking rich. I bet every person in this room, every person who will ever hear this message has possessions that people in other places could only dream about. Maybe you don't have everything you want. That's not the definition of poverty. I hate to break it to you. But if you have a roof over your head, clean water available to you, food in your belly, the latest gadget of sorts, a TV to watch, a vehicle, even if it's a bicycle, to get around, you have a great deal of wealth. So my question for you today, is this America's problem? Is that what it is? Have we, have we narrowed it down? Is this why 
Getting people to serve in the house of God is harder here than in places where they have next to nothing. Is this it? Is this our big dilemma? Is that we have many possessions and it's hard for us. It's difficult for us to leave those possessions. To not put priority on those possessions. If this church were in Vietnam, I challenge you, I, I declare to you that it would be absolutely packed, overflowing in the balcony. Be packed. We went to a church on Sunday morning. Twice this many people, one third the space. I mean, we were crammed in like this. I mean, I hope you don't have to go to the bathroom because you ain't going nowhere, honey. You know how many people complained? You know how many people walked away and said, oh, that's too crowded. Nobody. They couldn't get them all in. So that's, I'm trying to, I'm trying to process this with you. Is this America's problem? Is that in a way, we are all the rich young ruler. I wonder how many of us, if we had this conversation with Jesus, I mean, if he spoke really directly to us, to our possessions, and said, well, there's still one thing you lack. You need to sell this favorite toy, this favorite possession. You, you need to get rid of that and then come and follow me. How many of us would walk away sad? How many of us would walk away rejoicing, saying, now I know? So I'd like to think it'd be an easy choice. Come on, somebody. How many would like to think it'd be an easy choice? I'm not sure it's as easy as we think it is. <laughs> Let's keep going. I'm almost done. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved? They asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. Everything is possible. You see, when we set up that introduction today, it wasn't to say that everything is possible for whatever you want, everything you need, is that everything is possible for you and I to overcome our possessions. Look, at, this is the context of the verse. Is that in spite of having great possessions, it's possible for you and I to come to Jesus. But it's something I hope that you and I can clearly see that Many times we may have to choose between them. You know, I, I remember growing up in church hearing people say, well, it's okay for you to have possessions. The problem is when the possessions have you. And I think a lot of us kind of, oh, okay, good. I get to keep my possessions. We kind of like just kind of wrote it off as, oh, okay, it's good. I don't think we're very honest a lot of the time about the reality of our possessions possessing us. We, it's easy for us to say they don't, but do they? I wonder today as you, as you take this, it's my mission to give card, as you, you think about this, I wonder how many of us in the room today cannot give what we'd like to give because we've already given it to our possessions. I want you to think about that for a minute. See, each and every one of us, myself included, has an available amount of 
money. Maybe yours is big, maybe yours is little. It's not really important about how much it is. But when you take your debt payments, your car payments, your house payments, your other payments, every one of those payments is the money you contribute to your possessions. Think about that for a minute. Doesn't it just blow your mind? I mean, if you were to take all of that and put it into a category, put it at the top of the category, payments to my possessions. And then you were to analyze that and say, how much am I giving to my possessions versus how much am I giving to the kingdom? I wonder how many of us would be absolutely shocked that the vast majority of our earning potential is dedicated to the cause of increasing our possessions. I'm not trying to shame anybody. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad or guilty. I got as much stuff as anybody. In fact, I... I went into my closet last night to count my shoes. <laughs> I don't have any expensive shoes. Some of them were gifts. If you count my wife buying them, they were almost all gifts. But I had 22 pairs of shoes. <laughs> Doesn't that seem like, I was like, it's ridiculous. What do I need 22 pairs of shoes for? What does anybody need 22 pairs of shoes for? And I'm not going to go give away all my shoes or anything later today. I'm not in guilt. I just want us to ask this question out loud and honestly. How much of our earning potential is being dedicated to our possessions versus dedicated to the kingdom of God? Because people like Doug and Bonnie, they can't go help those churches without people like you being willing to say, you know what? My possession ratio is too high. I mean, imagine if we got like that. Just imagine if we started to think, okay, I don't need as nice a car because I want to make sure I have enough money to send Jonathan and Sarah Strong $200 a month or something like that. I know people driving cars that cost more a month than many people's house payments. And again, it, you get really off into weird land judging other people when you start saying what's too much for some people versus another. I don't like that. The question isn't about what other people are spending. The question is about what are we spending? What if we got so radical in our faith that we said, you know what? Maybe I don't need as big a place to live in because it's more important to me to give to the kingdom. It's more important to me. Can you imagine how funded People like Doug and Bonnie and Jim. I bet Jim, in all the conversations I've had with him over the last six years, I've never once heard him say, you know what? We just have too much money. Can you help me think of ways to spend it? We could do more in our community. I just can't come up with any more ideas on how to spend all the money that's coming in. In fact, I don't think I've ever heard any missionary ever say that their problem was too much money. And I'm pretty sure 100% of them has had to say something like this. We're still believing for our total budget to come in. Think about Jonathan and Sarah. They have given up every single comfort that you and I take for granted. To live in the middle of the third world.
the least we can do is make sure that these people around us are funded. Because it's our mission. It's not just their mission. It's our mission. And if we can't go with them, we can send our money with them. Amen? I had more, but I'm way out of time. <laughs> Let me pray this over you. God, help us to be honest in our reflection of ourselves. It's so easy to look at the story of the rich young ruler and think it means somebody else. Even the disciples heard the story and worried about themselves when they asked the question, who then can be saved? So God, I pray for America right now, God. Father, I pray for rev revival in this place. That we would easily be able to choose between our possessions and the kingdom of God. It wouldn't be a struggle for us. But Father, we would dedicate our earning potential to growing your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Everybody said...